but Gaydon was out of his reckoning. There were no fairy tales told for Missa to overhear, and the Princess Clementina slept in her corner of the carriage. If a jolt upon a stone wakened her, a movement opposite told her that her sentinel was watchful and alert. Three times the Berlin stopped for a change of horses, and on each occasion Wogan was out of the door and hurrying the ostlers before the wheels had ceased to revolve. You should sleep, my friend, said she. Not till we reach Italy, he replied, and with the confidence of a child she nestled warmly in her cloak again and closed her eyes. This feeling of security was a new luxury to her after the months of anxiety and prison. The gray light of the morning stole into the Berlin and revealed to her the erect and tireless figure of her savior. The sun leaped down the mountain peaks, and the gray of the light was now a sparkling gold. Wogan bade her highness look from the carriage window, and she could not restrain a cry of delight. On her left, Mountain Ridge rose behind Mountain Ridge, away to the towering limestone cliffs of Monte Scanupia, page 239, on her right, the white peaks of the Ordo Diabrum flashed to the sun, and between the hills the broad valley of the Adige rolled southwards, a summer country of villages and vines, of mulberry trees, and fields of maize, in the midst of which rose the belfries of an Italian town. This is Italy, she cried. But the emperor's Italy, answered Wogan, and at half-past nine that morning the carriage stopped in the public square of Trent. As Wogan stepped onto the ground, he saw a cloud of dust at the opposite side of the square and wrapped in that cloud men on horseback like soldiers in the smoke of battle, he heard, too, the sound of wheels. The Prince of Baden had that instant driven away, and he had taken every procurable horse in the town. Wogan's own horses could go no further. He came back to the door of the carriage. I must search through Trent, said he, on the mere chance of finding what will serve us. Your Highness must wait in the inn, and Clementina, muffling her face, said to him, I dare not. My face is known in Trent, though this is the first time ever I saw it. But many gentlemen from Trent came to the Innsbruck Carnival, and of these a good number were kind enough to offer me their hearts. They were allowed to besiege me to their content. I must needs remain in the shelter of the carriage. Wogan left Missit to stand sentinel, and hurried off upon his business. He ran from stable to stable, page 240, from inn to inn. The Prince of Baden had hired thirty-six horses, six more were nowhere to be found. Wogan would be content with four, he ended in a prayer for two. At each house the door was shut in his face. Wogan was in despair, nowhere could delay be so dangerous as at Trent, where there were soldiers, and a governor who would not hesitate to act without orders if he suspected the Princess Clementina was escaping through his town. Two hours had passed in Wogan's vain search, two hours of daylight, during which Clementina had sat in an unharnessed carriage in the market square. Wogan ran back to the square, half expecting to find that she had been recognized and arrested. As he reached the square, he saw that curious people were loitering about the carriage, as he pushed through them, he heard them questioning why travelers should on so hot a morning of spring sit muffled up in a close, dark carriage when they could take their ease beneath trees in the inn garden. One man laughed out at the princess and the comical figure she made with her scarlet cloak drawn tight about her face. Wogan himself had bought that cloak in Strasbourg to guard his princess from the cold of the Brenner, and guessed what discomfort its ermine lining must now be costing her. And this lout dared to laugh and make her, this incomparable woman, a butt for his ridicule. Wogan took a step towards the fellow with his fists clenched, but thought the better of his impulse, and turning away ran to the palace of Prince Taxis. Page 241 This desperate course alone remained to him, he must have speech with the Prince Bishop himself. At the palace, however, he was informed that the prince was in bed with the gout. Mr. Wogan, however, insisted. You will present my duties to the prince, you will show him my passport, you will say that the Count of Cerns has business of the last importance in Italy, and begs permission, since the Prince of Baden has hired every post horse in the town, to requisition half a dozen farm horses from the fields. 
Mr. Wogan kicked his heels in the courtyard while the message was taken. At any moment some rumor of the curious spectacle in the square might be brought to the palace and excite inquiry. There might be another courier in pursuit besides the man whom Gaydon kept a prisoner. Wogan was devoured with a fever of impatience. It seemed to him hours before the prince's secretary returned to him. The secretary handed him back his passport, and on the part of the prince made a speech full of civilities. Here's a great deal of jam, sir, said Wogan. I missed out me but what there's a most unpalatable pill hidden away in it. Indeed, said the secretary, the prince begs you to be content and to wait for the post horses to return. Ah, ah, cried Wogan, but that's the one thing I cannot do. I must speak plainly, it appears. He drew the secretary out of earshot, and resumed, page 242, my particular business is to catch up the prince of Baden. He is summoned back to Innsbruck. Do you understand? he asked significantly. Sir, we are well informed in Trent as to the emperor's wishes, said the secretary, with a great deal of dignity. No, no, my friend, said Wogan. It is not by the emperor the prince of Baden is summoned, though I have no doubt the summons is much to his taste. The secretary stepped back in surprise. By her highness the princess, he exclaimed. She changes her mind, she is willing where before she was obdurate. To tell you the truth, the prince plied her too hard, and she would have none of him. Now that he turns his back and puts the miles as fast as he can between himself and her, she cannot sleep for one of him. The secretary nodded his head sagaciously. Her highness is a woman, said he, and that explains all. But it will do her no harm to suffer a little longer for her obstinacy, and, to tell you the truth, the prince taxis is so tormented with the gout that that you are unwilling to approach him a second time, interrupted Wogan. I have no doubt of it. I have myself seen prelates in a most unprelatical mood. But here is a case where needs must. I have not told you all. There is a devil of a fellow called Charles Wogan. The secretary nodded his head. Page 243 a mad Irishman who has vowed to free Her Highness. He has set out from Strasbourg with that aim. He will hang for it, then, but he will never rescue her, and the secretary began to laugh. I cannot upon my honor vex the prince again because a gallows bird has prated in his cups. No, no, said Wogan, you do not follow me. Charles Wogan will come to the gallows over this adventure. For my part, I would have him broken on the wheel and tortured in many uncomfortable ways. These Irishmen all the world over are pestilent fellows. But the trouble is this, if Her Highness hears of his attempt, she is, as you sagely discovered, a woman, a trivial, trifling thing. She will be absurd enough to imagine her rescue possible she will again change her mind, and it is precisely that which General Heister fears. He would have her formally betrothed to the Prince of Baden before Charles Wogan is caught and hanged sky-high. Therefore, since I was pressing into Italy, he charged me with this message to the Prince of Baden. Now observe this, if you please. Suppose that I do not overtake the Prince, suppose that Her Highness hears of Wogan's coming and again changes her mind, who will be to blame? Not I, for I have done my best, not Prince Taxis, for he is not informed, but Prince Taxis is secretary. The secretary yielded to Wogan's argument. He might be in a great fear of Prince Taxis, but he was in a greater of the Emperor's wrath. He left Wogan, page 244, again, and in a little while came back with the written permission which Wogan desired. Wogan wasted no time in unnecessary civilities. The morning had already been wasted. The clocks were striking one as he hurried away from the palace, and before two the Princess Clementina was able to throw back her cloak from about her face and take the air, 
but the Berlin was on the road from Trent to Rovredu. Those were the four worst hours since we left Innsbruck, she said. I thought I should suffocate. The revulsion from despair, the knowledge that each beat of the hoofs brought them nearer to safety, the glow of the sun upon a country which was Italy in all but name, raised them all to the top of their spirits. Clementina was in her gayest mood, she lavished caresses upon her little woman, as she called Mrs. Missit, she would have woven give her an account of his interview with Prince Taxis' secretary, she laughed with the merriest enjoyment over his abuse of Charles Wogan. But it was not myself alone whom I slandered, said he. Your Highness had a share of our abuse. Our heads wagged gravely over woman's inconstancies. It was not in nature but you must change your mind. Indeed, your Highness would have laughed. But at all events her Highness did not laugh now. On the contrary, her eyes lost all their merriment, and her blood rushed hotly into her cheeks. She became for that afternoon a creature of moods, now talking quickly and perhaps a trifle wildly, page 245, now relapsing into long silences. Wogan was troubled by a thought that the strain of her journey was telling its tale even upon her vigorous youth. It may be that she noted his look of anxiety, but she said to him abruptly and with a sort of rebellion. You would despise any woman who had the temerity to change her mind. Nay, I do not say that. But it is merely politeness that restrains you. You would despise her, judging her by men. When a man changes his mind, why, it is so, he changes his mind. But when a girl does, it may well be that for the first time she is seriously exercising her judgment. For her upbringing renders it natural that she should allow others to make up her mind for her at the first. That I think is very true, said Wogan. Clementina, however, was not satisfied with his assent. She attacked him again and almost vindicatively. You of course would never change your mind for any reason, once it was fixed. You are resolute. You are quite, quite perfect. Mr. Wogan could not imagine what he had done thus to provoke her irony. Madam, he pleaded, I am not in truth so obstinate a fellow as you make me out. I have often changed my mind. I take some pride in it on occasion. Her Highness inclined to a greater graciousness. I am glad to know it. You shall give me, page 246, examples. One may have a stiff neck and yet no cause for pride. Wogan looked so woebegone under this reproof that Clementina suddenly broke out into a laugh, and so showed herself in a fresh and more familiar mood. The good humor continued, she sat opposite to Mr. Wogan, if she moved, her hand, her knee, her foot, must needs touch his, she made him tell her stories of his campaigns, and so the evening came upon them, an evening of stars and mysterious quiet and a clear, dark sky. They passed Rovridu, they drew near to Ala, the last village in the emperor's territories. Five miles beyond Ala they would be on Venetian soil, and already they saw the lights of the village twinkling like so many golden candles. But the Berlin, which had drawn them so stoutly over these rugged mountain roads, failed them at the last. One of the hindwheels jolted violently upon a great stone, there was a sudden cracking of wood, and the carriage lurched over, throwing its occupants one against the other. Wogan disentangled himself, opened the door, and sprang out. He sprang out into a pool of water. One glance at the carriage, dark though the night was, told him surely what had happened. The axle tree was broken. He saw that Clementina was about to follow him. There is water, said he. It is ankle deep. And no white stone, she answered with a laugh whereon I can safely set my foot?